354, uh, right to the left of the Media Center. Uh, I'm Tracy Klekla Jimenez, the coordinator for the Cultural Thursdays. Uh, next month, we have uh, Lyle Mitchell Corbin Jr., um, a cinematographer. He's going to be talking with the college community on his short film, Shanab, which pr was produced, it's an eight minute film, which was produced in 2016. Uh, according to the Walker Art Center, which ran the film as a part of their exhibit entitled DNA, Memory, Storytelling, and Cultural Heritage, Shanab follows a young Anishabi man as he struggled with his place in the inner city. This short film by Minnesota-based filmmaker Lyle Mitchell Corbin Jr. premiered in competition at the 2017 Sundance Film Festival. Corbin, the recipient of several grants from the Sundance Institute and the Minnesota State Arts Board is a Sundance Institute Time Warner Story Fellow as well. Um, through these mentorships, he's being mentored by world-renowned writers, directors, and producers throughout the development and production of his first feature film, which is called Wild Indian. So that's Thursday, November 1st, here in the Chalberg Theater. Um, there's just the noon time. Once again, if you're unable to make that presentation and you're interested, um, you can go to the uh, CLC YouTube um, live streaming channel. If you were to Google that, you would find um, the recording of that presentation or you could watch it live. Um, remember to turn off your cell phones and if you forgot to sign in for a class <coughs> at af <coughs> after the presentation, you can find those sign-ins um, outside. Today, as our featured speaker, we have Larry Fisk. Um, during the economic crisis, the uh, ongoing U.S. and ongoing U.S. sanctions, Larry Fisk visited um, just this past May and spent time with Venezuelan, Venezuelan friends. He explored Caracas, visited medical facilities, and met with intellectuals and authors to discuss the past, present, and future of Venezuela. Please join me in welcoming Larry Fisk. Thank you. <coughs> um, you probably all heard something or other in the news uh, in the recent times about Venezuela. Um, unfortunately, most of what we hear in this country is not true, and I would like to um, present some of the facts about the country. I'd like to give you a little background. Um, I visited Venezuela three times in recent years, all during uh, times of elections, two presidential elections and election for the National Assembly for the legislature. <coughs> I've also observed elections in Nicaragua, many elections, and I was an official electoral observer to uh, a Honduran presidential election about five years ago. So um, this year, uh, there were presidential elections in Venezuela in May. Um, they've been preceded by um, negotiations between the government and the opposition. The opposition wanted the elections postponed. The government did so. They thought they had an agreement. Um, at the end, the opposition said, we don't agree, we're, we're going to boycott the election. But the election went ahead, and there were several opposition candidates that ran, but some of the parties were boycotting the election. <coughs> the election happened at an extremely difficult time for Venezuela. Venezuela is a country that's dependent on oil. 90% of all of its foreign currency uh, comes from selling oil. Um, oil prices went in decline some years back, and Venezuela had been getting over $100 a barrel for its oil. And at one time, it was as low as somewhere in the 20 plus dollar uh, range, somewhere in the 20s. So they lost almost all of their income. Venezuela is a country that the, the economy has been distorted by being reliant on petroleum so that um, they don't produce a lot of things. They sell petroleum, they buy much uh, of what they consume, including a lot of their food. <coughs> it leaves them very vulnerable. Um, and what has happened is that uh, when uh, Obama was president, he declared that Venezuela was an extraordinary threat to the national security of the United States. It was a ridiculous statement, a ridiculous assertion. Venezuela is not a threat to anyone, not to anyone. They have a history of not having wars with anyone. They don't threaten anyone. 
the Constitution of the Republic, the Bolivarian Republic, declares Venezuela an area of peace. Um, <coughs> President Trump really uh, recently reiterated and signed the statement saying that Venezuela was an extraordinary threat to the United States. Obama had opposed sanctions, and Trump has imposed more sanctions. These sanctions have hurt people in incredibly. I know people who have lost 20 pounds because of the scarcity of food. <coughs> um, these sanctions don't allow Venezuela to do any international transactions in dollars. And dollars are the medium of trade in the world, the standard of trade, um, <coughs> the benchmark currency. Venezuela sent out over a billion, about $1.4 billion to purchase medicines and foods this last year. And the United States blocked those transactions, blocked the delivery of hundreds of thousands of doses of insulin, has made it so people cannot find the medicines they need literally to survive. I have one friend <coughs> in Venezuela who is a diabetic and is now trying to treat his disease um, by changing his diet. So the current, the attack on their ability to trade has been accompanied by uh, pressure worldwide by the United States to make sure that they cannot get loans. So they're in the situation where they were getting very little money for their petroleum, couldn't get loans, couldn't buy the food and medicines that they needed, and then the United States government declares that there's a humanitarian crisis in Venezuela and they want to help. Totally disingenuous. Um, it's a crisis that they've engendered. <coughs> so very difficult time. There's an attack on the Venezuelan currency. When I was there in May, I could change on the black market, which was the only way you could get currency, I could change $1 for 185,000 Bolivars. In other words, the currency was virtually worthless. Not only was the currency worthless, nobody had any. The currency is smuggled out of the country to Colombia as part of the economic war to make it so their economy won't work. Now the good news is, even though my, <coughs> my friends have been going through, <coughs> excuse me, very difficult times, they are very strong people and very, very proud people. And um, they're doing okay. And I'm glad to report that today they are doing better because of um, some very important changes that the, the president's made. Anyway, I'm gonna talk to you about Venezuela, the past, present, and future. Just to orient, um, Venezuela's right here, northern South America. Another view, see the Caribbean, and the Florida's up here. Uh, this is what it looks like topographically. There's a, a branch of the Andes Mountains that comes through the western part of the country. Got a major river system, the Orinoco, one of the great rivers of the world. They have great water resources, great agricultural lands. But unfortunately, because of the dominance of petroleum, destroyed the economy. They do, most people live in the cities. There's not enough people in the country producing food. And this is the political division of the country, the, the states. And the population is mostly concentrated in a belt through here. The capital of the country, Caracas, right there, uh, separated from the Caribbean by a small range of mountains. Now, of course, the people originally uh, in the country were indigenous peoples who lived there for thousands of years with many and varied cultures. But those people, like peoples throughout the Americas, encountered this, uh, and it led to devastation of their cultures. Uh, entire civilizations were wiped out from disease and warfare. And then Spanish uh, colonization went on for centuries thereafter. Um, this is the first Venezuelan who tried to break away from the colonial rule of Spain. 
Francisco de Miranda. He was unsuccessful in doing so. That was around 1806. He was followed by this man, Simon Bolivar, who was, to my mind, one of the most interesting personalities in the history of the world. Uh, extraordinary centuries before his time. <coughs> he was born into wealth on both sides of his family, uh, but he was orphaned quite young. Um, he lived a rather extraordinary life. He was raised by a black woman who he said was the only mother he ever really had. Uh, as a youth, he played with slave children uh, because not having a mother and father, he kind of was out of, out of the control of his family. As he got older, they kind of tightened down and made him go to school and stuff. But his experience uh, led him to a, a, a very uh, firm realization that all people are people. And he's very famous for being against racism, being against slavery. Um, and he, he went to Spain as a young man, met a woman, got married, went back to Venezuela. And he was literally, I, I believe, the richest man, the richest person in South America, tremendously wealthy. Eventually, he gave all of that to the revolution. Um, so he came back to Spain with his wife, he was in love. She very quickly uh, became ill and died. He went into mourning, depression. He went back to Europe. He lived a rather dissolute life, drank, philandered. Uh, when he was a young man, he had a tutor named Simon <coughs> Rodriguez, who was a progressive, who was a revolutionary, really, uh, a very liberal thinker. And um, they ran into each other in Europe. And his tutor, his former teacher, kind of gave him some tough love and said, you know, pull out of it. Your wife died, but there's the world and there's the problems of your country. And this apparently led to Bolivar, you know, pulling out of his, his depression and his rather dissolute ways. And this is a famous painting. He climbed a mountain, I believe, in Italy. And while on that mountain, <coughs> he determined that he would dedicate his life to struggling until his country was independent from Spain. And it's one of the m amazing stories of history that he, of course, the people behind him and allies, he actually accomplished this. It, it's, a, it's a great uh, triumph of, of, of history. So the uh, Venezuela declared its independence around uh, 1810 um, after 11 years of revolutionary war, went back and forth, terrible, horrible war. This was uh, one of his chief allies, one of his lieutenants, General Sucre, uh, who was betrayed and murdered, a very famous and important man in the history of human rights. Uh, because as a general in the army, he was the first one to promulgate regulations about the humane treatment of prisoners of war. Another hero of, hero of the revolution who won the Battle of La Libertad, uh, Rivas. Now, Rivas was betrayed also. He was tracked down by the Spanish. They cut off his head, boiled it in oil, and displayed it at the gates of Caracas. This would have been the centuries-old entrance to Caracas and near there uh, there's a monument and you can see Rebus's head that was on display by the Spanish. This was a brutal war. At some estimates, 20% of the population died. Um, I, I was talking to a Venezuelan friend on the phone a few days ago, an independent journalist, and he told me that on his mother's side, of the on both sides of his family go back to the Revolutionary War and that on his mother's side there had been a family of seven brothers, all of whom died during the revolution. And he reminded me that Venezuelans fought not just for the independence of Venezuela, but for Colombia, Peru, Bolivia, Ecuador. <coughs> There's a famous saying of his, uh, we can't choose between winning or death. It's necessary that we win. Like I say, very terrible 
war, great hardship to the people, and many people, this war is important to them to this to this day. Uh, and there's statue of Simon Bolivar. Every city and town has a uh, statue of Bolivar in the park, uh, the liberator. Uh, this is the monument to the uh, heroes of the revolution. And this was a young boy who um, the history of his country had a profound effect upon, Hugo Chavez. And as a young man, he wanted to be a baseball player. Um, the university where he lived did not have a baseball team, so he went to the next closest place, was a military academy, which had a baseball team. Um, while he was a young man in the army, um, the country had a, a, a brutal neoliberal regime. There was an uprising in 1992 that was put down with the killing of thousands of people in the street. This uh, had a profound effect upon Chavez and many other officers in the army, the Venezuelan off, uh, officer corps is a lot different than uh, many armies in South America in that people of humble origin and Chavez was of humble origin, could, uh, could rise in the, in the ranks. Uh, as a young soldier, he led an uprising, he led a coup attempt <coughs> against the government. Um, it, was, it was defeated and he was imprisoned. And you all see, it so this is pictures of him at different ages. That was him as a, as a youth. Uh, as a youth, he was known as Aranero, kind of like Spider-Man, because he, he sold little confections that looked like spiders. And when he uh, was unable to be successful in his coup attempt, there's a famous statement where he said that unfortunately they uh, couldn't achieve their objectives por ahora, for now. Uh, and he... He uh, had negotiated, he was able to make this announcement on TV and people saw him on TV and it really stuck in the public consciousness that he said, we couldn't achieve our objectives for now, but that left open the door that there could be changes in the future. And uh, he became a very popular, uh, almost mythological figure in the minds of the public. And there was a strong movement for his release. In the subsequent presidential election, one of the candidates as part of his platform said that he would release Chavez. He was elected and he released Chavez after two years of imprisonment. And you see Chavez uh, all, over the, all over the country, pictures of him, murals. Now Chavez said his philosophy, which he called Bolivarianism, uh, after Simon Bolivar had three roots. One was Simon, the thinking of Simon Rodriguez, who was Bolivar's tutor, and Bolivar himself, who was an extraordinary man intellectually, as well as in many other ways. Uh, one of his most famous statements, and it was repeated by President Maduro of, of Venezuela in the United Nations just a few days ago, uh, Bolivar's quote, he said that the United States of North America is destined by fate to torment Latin America in the name of liberty. And that has been true and remains true to this day. The third was General Zamora, who was a general during the Federalist Wars in the middle of the 19th century. And he also, he was a man who despised the rich. He was a man of the people. Um, his famous statement is, always talk to the people, always listen to the people. Chavez said these are the through three roots of, of Bolivarian thinking. And, one, and he was also against racism. One of the great accomplishments in Venezuela is they have a society which has far, far less racism uh, than you'll encounter in our country, for instance. And one thing that happened during Chavez's presidency, they pulled down the statue of Columbus put up the statue of Baikat Kuro, one of the indigenous uh, resistance leaders, and established, instead of Columbus Day, Indigenous Resistance Day. So Chavez uh, laid out a socialist program for the country, he established many social programs, uh, including one I'll tell you about later, Mission Vivienda, 
to build housing for every family in the country that lives in substandard housing, uh, many, many other uh, programs, universal free health care, for instance. So you'll see his image everywhere in the country. And uh, his famous saying was, Amor con amor se, amor con amor se paga. W you repay love with love. He loved his people. And they loved him. Unfortunately, in 2013, just a few months after he was reelected to the presidency, he, he died of cancer. Um, and there was an immense, I mean, the society went into, went into mourning. Uh, this is where he's buried. You see the structure up on the, on the hill there. This was in the past, uh, about 100 years ago, it was built and it was a military school. It's a very interesting building. Uh, and that's another saying where Chavez was talking about the possibility of his death. And he said that, you know, if, if he did die, at least the country, people now had a country that they were free and that the way that they could preserve their freedom was through unity, unity, and more unity. Uh, this is his tomb. And you see the woman tearfully leaning against his crypt. It's awfully, often quite emotional here. It's a simple but very, very beautiful place. different portraits all over the city. Before he died, when he was, just before he went to, can to Cuba for cancer surgery, um, he addressed the nation on TV and he said that it was plain as the full moon that people should vote for the vice president, Nicolas Maduro, to be the constitutionally elected president of Venezuela <clears throat> and that happened he was elected but the public was in mourning and there was a lot of confusion and all the polling had showed he'd win pretty easily he only won by 1.6 percent of the vote so it was kind of surprising and uh, when after he took office is when the oil crisis came when the U.S. the U.S. government thought okay Chavez is gone Chavez was a incredibly charismatic person. He was beloved around the world. It didn't matter where he went. He could go to Europe. He could go to Central America. He could go to Africa. And crowds of people would, would, would greet him. He was loved around the world. So people were mourning for the passing of Chavez. Uh, Maduro faced you know, economic hardships. The US decided to turn up the screws on him. So it's been five years of constant crisis, but Chavez has been proven right that Maduro was the person for the job. I personally think he's an incredibly strong leader in his speech he made at the UN last week. Uh, in preparation for this, I talked to eight or nine Venezuelans in the last few days, and they are all just extremely happy at Maduro's speech before the UN. And uh, last week before the UN, President Trump once again threatened Venezuela. Um, it's said that sometime in the past year, he wanted to attack Venezuela militarily, but he was talked out of it by his advisors. But he keeps saying that military options are not off the table. Um, and then he said some silly egotistical things. And the world at the United Nations laughed at President Trump. You, some of you may have heard it. The world laughed at President Trump. The next day, President Maduro spoke, and he received rich applause, and people lined up to shake his hand. Venezuela is not isolated in the world. The United States is trying to isolate them, but most countries have good relations and a high amount of respect. Before being president, before being vice president, uh, Nicolas Maduro was for years the foreign minister. He knows people around the world. He's highly respected. He's an excellent diplomat. So the 
the Venezuela that Nicolas Maduro is president of today, this is a view of downtown Caracas from uh, the building where Chavez's tomb is. And these are just some typical neighborhoods. Caracas is spread through a valley, lots of big apartment buildings and other tall buildings, and then more humble people live up the sides of the hills and the mountains. Uh, this is a group of young activists that I went to a, a, a protest with. This is the Yellow House. It's a very historic building and a government building. Oh, and I, I should say, so um, I was in Venezuela for three weeks this time. Um, I, I was actually a, uh, uh, an international accompaniment to the electoral process. That is, I was recognized by the government. And that gave me access to voting places. I could go in and watch the entire process. Um, and as part of the group, I was most, there was a few Americans and a lot of uh, Canadian trade units that I was with just part of the time. And uh, we were able to go uh, be addressed by, this is the foreign minister, Jorge Ariasa. He's a son-in-law. He was married to Hugo Chavez, his old, oldest daughter. And he addressed us and he said, there'll be an election in a few days and the election will be a choice between capitalism and socialism. And this is the uh, main square in downtown uh, Caracas. I always spend time there just to see what's going on, how people are doing, watch children play and such. And right by the corner there, this is called the hot corner, and this is where people go to discuss politics. It's always interesting. Um, we were also able to meet with a, uh, was a coalition of human rights groups. Um, last year, um, the right wing, who have not been able to win power through elections, uh, took to the streets, barricaded uh, main arteries of travel and neighborhoods in Caracas, uh, burned public buildings, burned public transportation. They burned 100 uh, brand new buses just at a shot. Um, caused hundreds of millions of dollars of damage, um, caused the death of a couple hundred people. Um, in the U.S., it was portrayed as President Nicolas Maduro was a dictator suppressing peaceful demonstrators that just wanted democracy. Nothing could be further from the truth. This is the mother of one of the persons who was killed in, in that. And I'm just showing, I could show you horrendous pictures. They literally set 20 or 30 people on fire grabbed them, doused them with gasoline, and some of those people burned to death. Uh, these were not peaceful demonstrators. Imagine if we went to Minneapolis, cut down the trees, blocked roads, had Molotov cocktails, homemade mortars, were burning down buildings. This is attacking a military base that I'm familiar with in the center of Caracas, knocking it down, setting. Imagine if you went to Camp Ripley, knocked the gate down, and started burning vehicles. What might happen to you? That's what these people were doing. Uh, this is a, a, a different uh, human rights organization that I was able to visit and hear a presentation at. I talked to a member of this group just a couple days ago, and he assured me through his research that violations of human rights are absolutely contradicted to the policy of the government of Venezuela. During those riots, there was some excess on the part of police and National Guard, and many of those people who did that are in prison right now. Police go to jail on a, it's not rare in Venezuela at all. Uh, this is a group of labor unions, unionists we were able to meet with. This is the mayor of a town of the state of, uh, in, in a city in the state of Aragua. He's the most popular mayor in the country. I believe he's reelected with 84% of the vote. Uh, these are youth, a youth activist organization. Uh, these teenagers that are working on Maduro's election. One of the Canadians said to this young man, so why aren't you playing video games or chasing girls or something? And he said, when I was a boy, um, I watched speeches of President Chavez and I decided I wanted to help my country. Uh, this is the governor of the state of Vargas, Governor Conero. Uh, he's kind of a national hero himself. Um, when Chavez was president in uh, 
2002, there was a, a, an attempted coup. Part of the military kidnapped him, took him away for two days. And this man, along with others uh, who were loyal to Chavez, um, led the resistance. And they basically told that part of the military, either you let Chavez go or we're coming after you. So he, he is quite a well-known uh, figure himself. This state, uh, the year after Chavez was elected, uh, which would have been, let's see, 99, 1999, I believe, um, had tremendous rain and flooding and uh, landslides, and thousands or tens of thousands of people were buried alive here. So this governor's done a tremendous rebuilding project. He uh, showed us a video presentation about that. Here he is with the mayor. They seem to have a super good relationship. Uh, I asked that I was able to have a personal conversation with the mayor, and I asked about corruption in the government, which is a, a, a substantial problem. And he said, it's not just the government. He said, it's a cultural phenomenon. It goes way back, but we're working on it. They have a new attorney general, and there are now a couple hundred people in jail for corruption, including high up officials in the oil industry. I asked him what his feelings about the future were. He said, I'm very hopeful. He pointed up here. You can't see, but the fog's rolling in, but there's mountains stretching up there. He said, I'm very hopeful. He said, because I come from up there. I come from extreme poverty, and I'm very hopeful. And here he is with some of his constituents. Uh, this is at a housing project from the program I told you where they're building houses for the poor. And this man came out to say, it's not President Maduro's fault that we're having economic problems. It's the rich people colluding with the Yankees to try to destroy our economy and keep me from getting food and medicine. And when these apartments were built, there was the 700,000th unit. Today, they have built 2,200,000 homes or apartments. And the goal by the end of next year is to have built uh, 3 million. And they're now have, that was their original goal. And now they're saying by 2025, it'll be 5 million. And the majority of all the people in the country will have been placed into new housing. And we, got, we were walking through the area, and we got really a warm reception from people. And afterwards, some community people came out uh, we had a really nice time. People came out of the crowd, men and women hugged me, said, I love you. Thank you for coming. This is the National Assembly building. This is the assembly of the, the, the building of the National Constituent Assembly. The Constitution of Venezuela, which I have in English and Spanish up here, has a very special, excuse me, a very special provision that if the country is in crisis, there are various mechanisms by which a special election can be called to take the issues directly to the people. And uh, would have been a year ago, July, um, the president and his cabinet of ministers uh, called such an election. That's one part, one way in the Constitution which this can happen. And those elections were run. The opposition uh, decided to boycott. So they didn't get any members. But this constituent assembly is made up from people all over the country. And it actually has plenipotentiary powers. They have the powers to deal with crisis, to pass economic laws, et cetera, et cetera. And one thing they're empowered to do, and which they're doing right now, is revising the Constitution, which they love. Uh, Somebody gave me a copy of the, every time I go to Venezuela, at least one person gives me a copy of the Constitution. They love their Constitution, um, but they're gonna make it, they're gonna make it better. Um, and that'll uh, probably happen sometime next year. It'll go to a vote of the people after discussion in public forums and uh, input from the public. Um, this was uh, a gathering where some of the constituent assembly members, people who are elected by the public, um, were giving a report back to the community. Um, you see the woman on the left is obviously a disabled person. The election for uh, representatives to the constituent assembly 
was not simply a, a, a vote by population to elect members. There were candidates from various segments of the society, including disabled persons, elderly people, students, teachers, business people, etc. So that every sector of the society has represent, representation in this National Assembly. And uh, she gave a, a very nice talk, a very confident woman, and, and people with disabilities have representation. Uh, back at the governor, the governor uh, took us to the um, the uh, government complex, uh, interesting buildings uh, by the ocean, and he showed us a presentation about how they've been rebuilding the state after the devastating natural disaster I told you about, and we were out at the street getting ready to say goodbye to him, and he had his granddaughter out there, and um, I was really surprised. <laughs> He said, well, go say hi to the senor, because there's a bunch of Canadians and Americans speaking a foreign language at night down on the street. But she was a very confident young girl and came over to say hi to me. And there are some of the apartment buildings that I've talked about uh, that have been built. They're all over the place. And these are some uh, athletic fields that Chavez uh, had built. Uh, sports are very big in Venezuela, like they're everywhere. And the government strongly encourages it. Uh, for the health and well-being of the public. Here you see, I mean, this area here, there are scores upon scores of these buildings going up. I mean, thousands upon thousands of apartments. It's just some more view of the city. And then there's another program that's not to build new housing, but to refurbish old housing. And they've refurbished, oh, around 700,000 units. And this one was quite a few years ago. I thought it was quite pretty and attractive with the pink tree. But um, yeah, I've met people where their windows have been replaced, their doors, their roof, uh, maybe their plumbing to make old housing uh, uh, more functional. Um, every neighborhood in Venezuela, hypothetically at least, is divided into communal councils. This woman is the head of the communal council in her neighborhood. And that is a local citizens group representing all the families. Uh, and they can apply to the government to get grants for uh, um, public projects in their neighborhood. They had <laughs> repaved some streets and we're doing it. Now she's out. Uh, the government has a program. Like I told you, there's a food crisis. Uh, it's better today. But when I was there, it was particularly bad. Um, and the government has a program to. Uh, deliver cheap food to people. It's called the CLAP program. And uh, if it's in bags like this, it's stuff that was produced in Venezuela. Often it's in boxes, and that's foreign produced stuff. But uh, all the people in the community come. She had the list of, uh, like if you got a big family, you get two bags. Uh, this is some stuff out of a CLAP box. This is Im imported foods. But the government's uh, in many ways working, I mean, they're working on every social program, every program. And that program of building housing continued right through the worst economic times possible. I mean, literally, worse than the Depression was in the United States. This is people buying food when I was there in May. There was plenty of food, but it was just extremely expensive and people didn't have money. Uh, I bought mangoes from this person. Like I said, there was almost no currency. Um, I did have a little currency, but he, he, he wasn't set up to take currency. Um, you'd have to go around the corner and pay with a debit card. I bought some mangoes from him. And by the way, you've heard about a refugee crisis uh, from Venezuela. Um, historically, the refugee crisis has been from Colombia to Venezuela. Venezuela has about 30 million people. 5.6 million of them are actually Colombians. And they receive full social services from the Venezuelan government. Um, he said, yeah, I'm from Colombia. I'm not going back to Colombia. He said, my life is much better here in Venezuela. Just an example of the inflation. A case of beer cost 3,450,000 bolivars. Uh, this is a Carnet de la Patria, a new program by the government that they uh, 
by which they deliver many of their benefits. Uh, they have a lot of what they call bonos, bonuses. That they, like if you're pregnant, you get bonus. Every month they put a, some money on your card. Uh, on, uh, on May 1st, which is the International Workers' Day, every working person gets a bonus put on their card. And there's many other programs. If you're a, a, a family that's been uh, recognized as being extreme poverty, every month they put it. By the way, Venezuela may be the only country in the world, I'm not sure about this, every single senior citizen, 60 years of age for men, 55 years of, for women, receives a pension every month. Uh, now it can go on your card, but now you, they can go uh, get it out in cash, because there is cash now. Just want to show you something about it. I ran into this many times, people playing bingo, dominoes, cards out on the streets of their neighborhood. Uh, these are a group of friends of mine. These are retired university professors, a music professor, a sociology history professor, mathematics professor, a uh, historian. There's a historian friend of mine named uh, Geronimo Perez Rescanieri, and he's the author of this three-set volume of history um, from Christopher Columbus to Hugo Chavez, and he has a national radio program uh, which he interviewed me on. And we gathered in the park with a bunch of other friends and um, talked, some more people joined us later and we talked until dark, literally about the, the history of Venezuela, current events, and the future. And, it's, and I was there at the hardest time. And most people that they were going through hardships hard, told me they were hopeful for the future. That, Simon Bolivar was known as a man of difficulties, and they kind of figure it's part of their history. And they know that if you stand up to the United States of America, the most powerful country that's ever existed, and say, we're going to be free and sovereign and do things our own way, that a price is going to be paid. Uh, so they are mostly hopeful, troubled but hopeful. Um, about education in the country. One of Chavez's programs that continues today is free university education. This is the Central University of Venezuela uh, in Caracas. A young friend of mine and I walked there from a couple miles away. It's uh, very large, thousands and thousands of students. Um, students in college, in actually in elementary school at some point, in high school, and in college, receive a free laptop computer from the government. And those are, I believe, manufactured in Venezuela. They were originally in Portugal. I think they, I think they at least assemble them, if not manufacture them in Venezuela now. There's the uh, university library, humanities and education department. Uh, here's a fellow that I met, um, very interesting man. He teaches languages, of course, his, uh, native language is Spanish. He teaches German, Russian, and English. Um, and we talked extensively uh, about his subject, about Venezuela. He said the, the students get a good education. I asked him if he could make it on a salary. He said no. He uh, has a second job translating for a company about an hour away from the city that does business with Russia. And he said he's very hopeful for the future of the country. Uh, I spent a lot of time looking into the medical system, free medical care. But as I said, medicines are hard to get a hold of and expensive. They're experiencing shortage. This is a med I just, we were driving along, a friend of mine has a car, we were driving along outside of Caracas in the country a little bit and just saw this clinic, pulled over, went in, see what's happening. This is a Cuban doctor at the clinic. Talked to him a little bit. He said he had to get back to work, but um, here, here's some more of the staff. Uh, there's one of the patients. Here's a Venezuelan doctor. So the basic uh, arrangement is that the Cuban doctors provide medical care um, part of the time and teach the Venezuelan students. And I'm just going to show you. These are some small uh, neighborhood clinics. I went in and she said, I'll just show you what I do. She gave me an exam. 
she decided I was healthy, gave me my stats, uh, handed out these some kind of medication made from sugar cane in Cuba that they say is good for circulation, high blood pressure, gave me a bunch of them, and everybody that met say, hey, can I have some of those? Those are really good. <laughs> There's a, some of their medicines. This is a, another little clinic. Then went to some more sophisticated facilities with more diagnostics and uh, met a patient there, asked her uh, before the revolution, would you have been able to receive care in a clinic like this? And she said, no, no existia, they didn't exist. And here's some people with uh, in physical therapy. Uh, now here's a very high tech uh, facility with scans and other types of treatments. And then I was down there mainly for the ele because of the election. This is some uh, advertisements from Maduro and his chief uh, opponent. And there was ads on TV for, there was actually five candidates. Uh, Falcon, the main opposition candidate, ran on dollarizing the economy. Said he'd pay salaries and pensions in dollars and he'd bring in the IMF, he'd take loans from the IMF. Well, um, I think you probably know that um, it's a country rich in natural resources, more oil than any other country in the world, more gold than any other country in the world, fourth largest proven, proven reserve of natural gas, diamonds, coal trend, huge wealth is there. Plus, it's Venezuela was a leader of a movement for the Latin American community and the Caribbean to be independent, use their resources to, for the benefit of their own people, and U.S. corporations don't, don't like that idea. I'm going to try to hurry through here. So this was the uh, closing campaign rally for President Maduro. Here comes Hugo Chavez saying, vote for Maduro. Hundreds of thousands of people, if not more. This guy's kind of hilarious. <laughs> There's some Socialist Party members. And this is the crowd. I only was able to get two pictures of Maduro, and then there was just too many flags in my face. And this is uh, going out to observe the election. So basically, you go, you find your name, you find where to vote, you go in, you you go around in a horseshoe shape, you're identified, you go vote, you put your, it's an electronic machine, spits out uh, the result of your vote, you fold it up, you put it in a box, you come over, you uh, sign, you get your ID back, you apply your fingerprint, and you're done voting. Turnout? For turnout, you mean? Turnout was 46%. But that's 46% of almost everybody, because 97% of people are registered to vote. So if you break it down to what percentage of the voting population actually like elected the president, it's quite respect. It's better than Trump, uh, and comparable to the percentages that many other presidents receive. Um, so you go in. It's always in a classroom, and these are your uh, your poll workers who are chosen randomly and electronically from the uh, voter registry. Give them your ID. They scan your thumb to make sure you are who you say you are. You go to the voting area. It's backed up with a battery there because it's all electronic. There's the machine and the ballot. Uh, you'll see Maduro was supported by 10 parties, Falcon by four, 
and the other three candidates by one party or one guy had no party, he was just running on his own volition. So you press the picture and the party that you want to vote for, it comes up on the screen on the bottom, it says Votar, you push the vote button, it prints out the receipt, you put it in the box. It's quite simple, quite fast. There's people voting. Fingerprints all done. And this is after it's done, you break it down, the machine starts printing out the results. There's the results, tells everybody who voted for what party and what candidate. There's the device to electronically transmit the results. Um, and then 54% of these boxes are broken open and on the spot with all the witnesses and any citizen, even a foreigner, can go in and watch this. Abra and I have done it. Um, and they count the votes there and match it up to the machine. It's always perfect. It's a foolproof system. It works tremendously well. We should have it. He's showing that all the ballots have been counted. There they are. There's the tabulation. There's another place they were counting. Result, it's all done. There's the paperwork. And here's some uh, advantages I believe there are to the Venezuelan electoral system. They have a separate electoral branch of government that runs elections. It's standardized across the country. It's electronic with a paper trail. Immediate audit of 54%. Totally reliable. High voter registration. Poll workers are selected randomly. Uh, they have a mock early election to test the equipment, procedures, make sure everything's going to go. Voters don't have enough time. Voters can practice in public place. They set up machines where you can go learn how to vote and practice. I've done it myself more than once. Election day is always on a Sunday when people can get to the polls. In Crocus, at least, there's free public transportation. Uh, there's a limited campaign period. It doesn't go on forever. Uh, and it ends a few days before the election to give a cool down period. And alcohol is not supposed to be sold for those few days. Um, there's limited media campaign. There's Plenty of ads, everybody knows what people are for, but you're not bombarded, turn on the TV and they're all the time. I saw plenty of ads, but it's just not overwhelming. Uh, this is election night. I could have gone in here and listened to them uh, announce the results, but I just uh, was too tired. <laughs> so I was standing out here and finally security said, what are you doing here? And I said, a friend was supposed to pick me up, but they were starting to block off all the roads. So he called in the National Guard and they led me out my friend and I got home and just as he, I got up to my hotel the, now the election results were announced and this is the result um, what people ask me in Venezuela is what's this thing about where the person that doesn't get the most votes can win the election they're really mystified by that anyway in Venezuela whoever gets the most votes win Nicolas Maduro got the most votes right now no opposition public leader has a better uh, negative rating than 64%. There's not a single opposition leader that has any substantial support among the public. Nicolas Maduro is the president. Polling shows that people want him to try to solve the problems. Uh, these were some riot police stationed in front of my hotel, but there were no problems. Uh, this is next morning, same place, life as usual, picking up the trash. Uh, that's an opposition leader who I think he's 84% disapproved of. Um, they just put in a new currency, uh, so people have money now. Raise the minimum wage for three months. The government's paying all salaries of everybody in every job. They're paying the salaries for the... Uh... Yes, Gary. Uh, okay, the, uh, on gasoline, they're changing the system. They estimate that $15 billion of gasoline is smuggled every year into Colombia. Around the Colombian Venezuela border, the gasoline in Colombia, the gasoline is Venezuelan gasoline. They don't even supply their own gas. And even some reports are that Venezuelan gasoline smuggled into Colombia then gets sold internationally by Colombia. So they're now making it so you have to use that card that I showed, the Carnet de la Patria, and your thumbprint. Then you can get the cheap rate. And by the way, when I was there, gasoline cost one bolivar. And remember, for one dollar, I got 185,000 bolivars. A liter was costing one bolivar, so free. Gasoline is free. But they're now making it, unless you have that car, register your vehicle, um, you have to pay international prices. 
So they believe it'll stop the smuggling, which will stop a whole lot of other problems and keep more money in the country so they can build their economy. They just launched officially yesterday their new Petro, which is a, a cryptocurrency. It's now used for international trade. Turkey said they'll accept it. They've done it with China, with Russia. Um, it's the first cryptocurrency which is backed by natural resources. One Petro is worth the price of a Venezuelan barrel of oil, which, by the way, is up around $70 now, which is helping the economy a lot. They're really groundbreaking with this, and it's a way to get out from under the dollar. Like I said, the U.S. forbids countries to let uh, Venezuela trade in dollars. They've held up $1.4 billion of food and medicine that they already spent. They sent the money out there, and we basically stole it from them. It's in limbo somewhere. They're hoping that this will uh, improve that. This is him giving his speech before the U.N., and then he followed that with a speech with the Cuban president at the Riverside Church in Manhattan, which he was warmly received. Uh, he recently, recently met with the president of China. He met with the foreign minister of Russia. Uh, India has a good relation. Most people of the world respect trade and like Venezuela. Um, we should think about that ourselves. This is a group of militia. It's the lowest level of the armed forces in the country. These are neighborhood people. They wanted me to take their picture. They want us to know that they want nothing better than to be friends with us. But if we attack them, these people, millions of them, are ready to defend their country. They are sons and daughters of Bolivar and Chavez, and they will never give up their country. And what's the future about? It's about these guys. It's about him and him. It's about them. Don't they deserve to be able to get food and medicine if they need it? And what about her? Doesn't she deserve peace? Doesn't she deserve respect? And him, what? He deserves everything. He just wants to be a good boy and grow into a good man. We should be his friend. And what about her? What kind of a future does she, does she deserve? And that's my end of, of my presentation. If anybody has any questions, um, I'd be glad to answer them. Anyone? Only Gary? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. How's it going, Alex? All right.